Okay, we are going to look at chapter 11 for auditing now. Um, we're going to talk about inventory, goods, service, goods and services, accounts payable, and the acquisition and payment cycle. Um, kind of like the rest of it, we're going through um, our measuring of risk. We're going through how we form our audit opinion. I'll move on. So what, what accounts we're going to look at, what disclosures, what are relevant assertions um, in the acquisition and payment cycle, both with the inherent risk and material misstatement in the acquisition and payment cycle, identify and assess the fraud risks, um, identify and assess the control risks of material misstatement, uh, describe how we use planning in our analytical procedures and identify um, to identify possible material misstatements, um, look at resp responses to identified risks, um, appropriate tests of our controls within our, within, um, our payment cycle, um, determine and apply sufficient appropriate substantive audit procedures for testing acquisition and payment cycle, and then the professional uh, decision-making uh, framework for ethical decisions um, and issues involving and conducting an audit of acquisition payment cycle accounts. Okay, so the significant accounts, um, we'll talk about most of these individually throughout the chapter, but inventory, um, obviously inventory is always a big part of most companies' financial statements, obviously companies like the service industry less so than others. Um, but, you know, manufacturing facilities or anywhere that you have, even retail facilities, uh, inventory is a substantial uh, part of the balance sheet. Uh, cost of goods sold, another really important element because that is usually, for a lot of companies, a very large portion of their expenses. Um, so another very important and usually significant account for a lot of organizations. Accounts payable, you know, how much we owe people, liabilities are always obviously important to look into, and then other, other related expense accounts. Okay, and this is on page 571. So accounting for inventory is a major consideration for many organizations because of its significance to both the balance sheet and the income statement. That's where we talk about the balance sheet, obviously the inventory itself, the income statement, we're mainly talking about the cost of goods sold. We also have accounts payable that affects the balance sheet. Um, inventory are items that are tangible property um, that are held for sale in the ordinary course of business, um, that two, they're in process of production for such sale or to be used in production of goods or services available for sale. So effectively, uh, to take this back to cost accounting or, or managerial accounting, number one would be our finished goods, but it depends on our, our business, but if we're a manufacturing company, number one would be our finished goods, uh, number two would be our work in process, and number three would be our um, raw materials, generally speaking. So a major component of accounts payable relates to inventory purchases when shipments of raw materials and finished goods are received and placed in inventory. This results in an account payable, until uh, the payment is made. Accounts payables also comprise of amounts owed to other suppliers like electricity and other goods and services, so not just inventory. So accounts payable is not just inventory, um, but it is obviously, depending on our business, usually um, purchasing uh, is a major part of our accounts payable balance. Um, so here's the T accounts that show kind of the relationship between um, all of our different accounts that we're gonna look at throughout this chapter. Um, obviously, cash, we're talking about the disbursement cycle. Accounts payable, we just talked about. Inventory, we've talked about. Oh, we have our other expense accounts, too. Uh, we have factory overhead. Um, why that one is in there mainly is because it is applied to our inventory. Um, and then, obviously, as, as it's applied to our inventory, it also goes through um, into our cost to get sold eventually. Okay. So there's five distinct activities uh, within our acquisition cycle. Uh, the first is the requisition. Um, and this is on page 572, by the way. Uh, the first is the requisition. This is a request for goods and services in the first place. Uh, next is the purchasing of goods and services, buying it, you know, the actual buying of it, receiving it, um, approval of items for payment, and then the actual physical cash disbursements. So assertions, you'll notice this is something that happens in pretty much in every chapter. We talk about different things. We have our five assertions and we're talking about specifically how these apply and how these are relevant to inventory. So existence and occurrence, inventory balances exist at the balance sheet date, okay? Um, that they are uh, real and that they existed and that they have occurred, we have purchased it. Um, completeness, inventory balances include all inventory transactions that are taking place during the period. So we're not missing anything. Everything that we own and is part of our inventory should be there. 
Remember, this would include things that are in shipment, depending on whether it's FOB destination or FOB um, shipping point. Um, so making sure that we're complete uh, with regard to that. Rights and obligations, that they have title the inventory as of the balance sheet date. So remember, for example, again, I just used the FOB shipping point versus destination. Um, but also, uh, if we sell things on consignment, if we sell things on consignment, we don't actually have any legal rights to it. Um, a company, a one way to commit fraud would be a company claiming they have inventory that they don't actually have ownership rights to because they're selling it for someone else or on their behalf if it's through a consignment type contract, which means they have no title, which means it should not be on their balance sheet, even if it is on site at their location. Uh, valuation or allocation, uh, the recorded balances reflect the true underlying economic value of the assets. Um, and presentation disclosure, the inventory is classified properly on the balance sheet and disclosed in the notes of the financial statements as it should be. This is on 573. Okay. Um, the assertions related relevant to accounts payable. So we move on to our next account. Still the same, you know, five assertions, but how they apply to accounts payable in this case. This is on page 574. Um, existence and occurrence. So accounts payable balances exist at the balance sheet date. Um, completeness. Accounts payable balances include all accounts payable transactions that have taken place during the period. Um, so remember too, when I'm looking at these assertions, I'm going to make an important, hopefully an important point here for you. Um, whenever we look at these assertions and what we're trying to prove, we want to make sure that we think about if they were going to be stated incorrectly or stated with, uh, or with the intent of fraud, what direction would we want those to be in if we're a manager uh, for our company to look better? Um, so for example, inventory, chances are, depending on whether I'm trying to increase my income statement or my balance sheet um, aspects, chances are I'm looking to overstate the inventory. Um, if, I, if I'm balance sheet focused, because that means I have more assets, okay, which means I'm usually in a better financial position. Whereas accounts payable, completeness is the opposite. Um, I would generally like to have less liabilities, so there's more likely, the likelihood is an understatement. So when I'm, when I'm going through these assertions, I need to take into account, okay, if there is a bias, if there is a direction that fraud either could be committed or um, if there's motivation for fraud to be committed, what direction should, would we anticipate management um, committing fraud or even errors? Um, what direction would that more likely be in? Um, rights and obligations, if the organization actually owes a liability to the accounts payable as of the balance sheet date. Um, valuation allocation, uh, that the balances reflect the true underlying economic value of the liabilities. And then presentation disclosure. Accounts payable is properly classified on the balance sheet and disclosed in the notes of the financial statements. Okay, revenue cycle is on page 575. Um, in auditing the acquisition payment, the auditor will perform risk assessment procedures, test of the controls, and substantive procedures, phases two, three, and four of the audit opinion formulation process. Um, as part of performing risk assessment procedures, the auditor obtains information to assess risk of material misstatement. Uh, once those risks have been identified, uh, the auditor then will determine how best to respond to them. Very similar to what we do in all the rest of them. So remember our two major risks uh, that lead us to our overall audit risk are inherent risk and control risk. Um, so inherent risk within inventory um, it's usually material, it's usually complex, subject to manipulation, um, all uh, major inherent risks uh, with inventory. Why? Uh, because there's uh, usually a great diversity of inventory. Um, it's not usually, most companies don't just have one, L, one item of inventory, they could have hundreds or thousands. I mean, think about retail stores, think about Walmart, Target, those types of places, how many tens of thousands of items they have in, in their inventory and different items with that. Um, inventory accounts typically experience a high volume of activity, okay, meaning they're moving in and out uh, really regularly and really quickly. Uh, in inventory accounts may be valued according to various alternative accounting valuation methods. Um, uh, inventory, sorry, uh, identifying obsolete inventory and applying lower cost or market principle to determine the valuation um, could be difficult tasks. Inventory is easily transportable. It kind of depends on the inventory. Um, but a lot of inventory is fairly easily transportable, meaning people can steal it easily. 
Um, inventory often exists at multiple locations with some locations being remote from the company's headquarters. So the further something is away, distance uh, can create uh, inherent risk. In terms of accounts payable and related expense accounts, the auditor should consider the inherent risk that management is more likely to one, understate rather than under, overstate expenses and payables and classify expense items as assets. Okay. Identifying fraud risks, this is on page 577. So fraud risks in the acquisition and payment cycle, theft of inventory by an employee, um, inventory shrinkage. Uh, so theft is pretty obvious, but inventory shrinkage um, is kind of also includes theft, but it also includes loss. It even also includes breakage. Okay. Shrinkage can also be just, you know, someone ruined a, um, some, some of our products. Like I think I've told my example before where when I was working in my dad's warehouse and I put the brakes on the forklift a little too quickly and spilled half a pallet of, uh, I believe it was olives, but it was all in glass jars and it was just a complete mess. Uh, but that would be inventory shrinkage, right? Complete accident, broke it all, not obviously able to sell it in any way. Uh, that's inventory shrinkage. Employee schemes including are involving vendor fraud. Uh, remember this would include not be limited to fictitious vendors um, where I'm paying a fictitious vendor and really paying myself. Um, employees, recording fictitious inventory or inappropriately recording higher values for existing inventory. Um, large manual adjustments to inventory accounts, schemes to classify expenses as assets, um, and executive misusing travel entertainment accounts and charging them as company expenses. Um, so methods of fraudulent reporting for inventory and cost of goods sold. This is on the bottom page 577, exhibit 11.2. Purchase inventory, um, this affects our inventory and accounts payable. Possible manipulation to under-record under purchases um, or record purchases in a later period uh, or fail to record purchases. Um, so this would, if I did any of these, under-record purchases, record purchases in a later period or fail to record, this would decrease my liability and accounts payable more than, more than anything else as a goal here. Uh, returning inventory to a supplier. Uh, we could overstate our returns or record returns in an earlier period than when I actually return them. Um, inventory is sold. Um, the accounts affected a cost of goods sold in inventory recorded uh, at too low an amount, um, not record cost of goods sold nor reduce inventory. Um, so this one is more manipulation to the uh, income statement. Um, if my cost of goods sold is lower, then my net income would be overall higher. Um, so the goal with this type of manipulation would be to to increase my income by reducing my cost of goods sold. Inventory becomes obsolete. We fail to write that off um, or uh, write it down to lower cost or market, then I'm overvaluing or overstating my inventory balance. Um, and then periodic account of inventory quantities should help our inventory shrinkage or inventory account, um, but we could overcount or the possible manipulations is overcounting or double counting our inventory. Okay, this is page 578, identifying control risks. Um, the auditor needs to understand the controls that the client has designed and implemented to address the inherent and fraud risks of material misstatement in the acquisition and payment cycle. The auditor typically obtains understanding by a walkthrough process, inquiry, observation, and review of the client's documentation. The auditor considers both entity-wide and transaction controls um, and the assertion levels. So an overview of an internal control system for the acquisition and payment cycle. A good control system should provide that all, and I'm on page 579 now, all purchases are authorized in some way. Um, there exists a timely, accurate, complete recording of all the inventory transactions. Uh, the receipt of inventory is properly accounted for and independently tested to verify quality and adheres to company standards, um, and that the cost accounting system is up to date and costs are properly identified and assigned to products and variances are analyzed, investigated, and properly allocated to inventory and cost of goods sold. All right, different types of inventory systems. And we study both these in financial accounting. This is again on page 579. Uh, there's two major types of inventory systems. 
obviously we have our methods like FIFO, LIFO, you know, weighted average, that kind of thing. But, uh, but when we're talking about the overall system, remember we have a periodic and a perpetual system as our two kind of overarching options. Periodic system um, is a system in which record keeping management does not keep a continuous record of changes. Instead, at the end of the accounting period, management determines the ending inventory by a physical count of every item and it computes its value using a suitable method. So effectively, rather than every single time I sell something recording it, I am recording all my purchases, everything. I have a beginning amount because it was my ending amount from the prior count, physical count. And then I have uh, all my purchases that have come in, so I add all those. And then I can go out and count my ending inventory and effectively figure out how much um, I sold. Um, now, depending if this sort of raw materials obviously be how much I used in my um, process, but effectively um, I can I can come down to the number of what went out. But I only do that. Different companies are different. Once a month, once a quarter, once a year is pretty long, but could be. Um, and that would be a periodic inventory system. A perpetual inventory system, on the other hand, every single time I make a sell, sale, I record um, in, on my books what the cost of goods sold is, um, so that I do this on a regular basis. Um, this is a kind of more, a more accurate system. It's also good for keeping track of your, my availability of my goods. It's a better way to know how much I have on hand at any given time. Um, so this is, a, this is record keeping where book inventory is continuously an agreement with inventory on hand within specific time periods. Now, I still would uh, go out and take regular physical counts on uh, every so often, uh, just to confirm that my system is working correctly and that I'm, that I'm right and make any corrections that need to be done. Um, but every time I make a sale, I'm really uh, recording it um, right then and there. Okay. Okay, then the last thing for this particular uh, lecture, um, other controls in the acquisition and payment cycle. Uh, we would assign employees systematically review to systematically review all of our products for obsolescence, follow up with the appropriate accounting action. Management periodically would review inventory and take action on excessive inventory. Um, market studies for quality control tests to perform, uh, are performed before new products are introduced. And we'd assign employees to monitor, closely monitor long-term contracts and excess purchase requirements and follow up with the appropriate accounting action. And that will be all for this video. We'll start with video two next.